Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for uh, what our worship experience has been thus far. And now, Lord, as we worship you through the preached word, we simply ask that you speak because your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, what, what's, what's interesting is that just this morning, while I was preparing this message, I deleted the title that I had chosen for the sermon, and I put in God's people, or excuse me, not God, good people will burn, amen? And I deleted the introduction that I had written. This morning, and, and here's why, here's why. While reading through the sermon and praying through the sermon, um, asking God to speak to me so I could speak to you, asking God to, to work through this broken vessel of a person and use this pitiful message that I put together to minister to those that hear it, I was struck with a thought. I'm asking God, you know, work through me, Lord. I mean, I have what I put on the paper, and it's a meager offering. Work through me. And, and, and I was struck with a thought. Uh, here, here's what the thought was. A lot of good people will burn. A lot of good people will be lost. Good people. And so, 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 so today, we're going to talk about how to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. Because a lot of good people will burn. But before we, before we, before we go into the meat of the message, I, I got to set, set a frame for the discussion. Here's the first thing, and please don't miss this. Every single person in this room, every person who has ever been born in the flesh except Jesus has been born lost. Everybody. There are no exceptions. When you were born, you were born lost in a lost state. Not saved. Born to burn. This is because of a because because of Adam's sin. We came into this world in with with it, it with broken relationships to God. Because of one man's sin. That's, that's the first thing I need you to, to, to capture as, as you listen to this message. Make no mistake about it. Every single person has been born, and when they were born, all of us who have been born, lost state. Number two, good people, kind people, generous people, who don't know Jesus in the forgiveness of their sins are lost. They, they, they are lost. They will die. They will burn in hell's fire. This is not a scare message. This is reality. We, 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 have, we, have, we, have, we have family members who are good people. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. We're not, while this is what made, well, I'm going to just be honest with you, and I, and I hope she's watching. I thought about my mother when I was writing this sermon. When, when I, and then what made me delete my introduction and change the title. I thought about my own mother. Good woman. She doesn't cause trouble in the world. Uh, she has answers, and she's helped for a whole bunch of folk who are in crisis. Raise me right. <laughs> she, she doesn't give her heart to the Lord. She's not going to make it. We, we have friends, good people. We have neighbors. Good people, they will cut your grass when they know you're on vacation. You don't even have to ask them. Good people. 
They're celebrities that we admire. Denzel, it's a, it's a good man. Um, uh, uh, what's her name? Aretha Franklin, everybody's auntie. Good woman. Far as we can tell, we enjoy them. Far as we know, they're good people. Our dentist, our hairstylist, our kids' teachers, right? The, you know, that, that one college professor, right? The mailman, uh, the mechanic, the grocery store clerk, the folk at that nonprofit that you work for, volunteer at, your favorite uncle. All of them, good people. But if they haven't given their hearts to Jesus, they are currently in a lost state. And when Jesus comes back, they will be eternally lost. You too. You are lost and will be eternally lost if you have not surrendered your hearts to the Lord either. Here's why I'm saying all of this. Here's, 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 listen, listen. I believe that most professed believers are good people. Amen? I believe, I believe that most, most professed believers know that God has put everything in place for us to enter into the kingdom, to enter into a saved relationship with him. I believe folk know that. How many of y'all know? Everybody knows that, right? But I also believe that most of those folk, most of us, fail to do our part or have failed to do it, and we are in a lost state and not recognize it. Jesus' shed blood on the cross of Calvary provides every human being forgiveness of sin, freedom from sin, and access to eternal life. Who says amen? amen. However, forgiveness of sin, freedom from sin, and access to eternal life are conditional. Thus, Assurance of salvation is not only based on what Jesus has done, it's also based on you and me meeting the conditions of salvation. Some, somebody right now is saying, wait a minute, pastor. Hold up. Salvation is a free gift. Huh. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. What, what in the world has gotten in the past of Randy? He preached those two sermons a couple of weeks back about sin. Now this dude's telling us there's some conditions to salvation. Said so that we have not done our part. Y'all know I must tell you why, right? I don't, I don't, I, I say amen 100%. We cannot earn salvation. Y'all know I've told you justification is all God. There's nothing we can do. Amen. I told you that we're saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God, not uh, of works, lest any man should boast. But the text says we're saved by grace through faith. Oh, there's a qualifier. It doesn't just say we're saved by grace. I, I, had, a, I had a preacher who told me one time, everybody comes in this, to this thing, and um, they're already in a saved state, and they just have to acknowledge it. What? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. Don't run past through faith. Too many of us have come into this thing and we've heard and we've been told that we're saved by grace and we just leave it at that. I know that we can't do anything to earn salvation but there are four conditions that have to be met if we want to be saved. If, if that grace is to be effectual, we got to repent. We got to confess. We have to believe and we got to surrender. At least, let me just say at least four. 
Just, I'm talking about just entering into the relationship. Are y'all with me? Confess, repentance, confession, belief, surrender. Are you with me? I'm going to go back and lay the foundation one more time. All people, everybody who breathes the air that God created, enter into life lost. It's appointed once for every man to die. And not then the resurrection, then the judgment. <laughs> Because you may die twice. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 37, uh, chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, on the day of Pentecost, the multitude, having been convicted of, of, of sin by the preaching of Peter, asked Peter, what shall we do? Peter preached the word, and they said, all right, Peter, what shall we do? And, and, and response Peter said one thing, repent. First condition, repent. In other words, in other words, what Peter said is drop every excuse you have for why you sinned. Quit finding reasons for why you did what you had did. And call sin, sin. He says, repent and reorder your lives so you don't do it again. Repent. Servant of the Lord says this, repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. I'm sorry I did it and I'm going to turn from it. The word repentance literally means turn your head 180 degrees. Anybody here repent? Turn your head. That means you don't look back at it again. If you do 360, you back where you started. She says, we shall not renounce sin until we see its sinfulness, <clears throat> until we turn away from it in heart. There will be no change. There will be no real change in the life. Repent. That's, that's, that's good. We're saved by grace through faith. The, the, the journey through faith. I have faith enough to believe that God has told me what's right. I have shown you, old man, what is good. God has told me what's right. And so therefore, since God told me that, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. So, so I don't know if I shared this with you or not. Maybe I did. I always tell the same stuff, man. I, I don't, it's okay. Um, repetition deepens the impression. Are y'all with me? <laughs> Plus, I'm getting a little older. Me and my family, we used to drive from Berrien Springs, Michigan at the seminary all the way down to Chicago Heights, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago for, for Wednesday night prayer meeting and for church. Two, two hours there, which was really an hour because we gained an hour, and then three hours back because we lost an hour. <laughs> but we were only in the car for two hours. But nevertheless, here's the thing. We jump in the car Sabbath morning like we always do in our big Ford E-150 van with monogram seats. Weren't our names on it, but they were monogrammed nonetheless. Hallelujah. <laughs> we jumped in that bed. Well, let me tell you something, man. We were going to, ch going to church, man. We put our cassette in, and we probably listened to some music and everything. And I'm riding down the road. And I say, hmm, when they start construction on this road? Now I go down a little further. Man, they didn't lower the speed limit. This is ridiculous. And I'm just talking and fussing because the speed limit's lower. And then the Lord said, dummy, you're going the wrong way. 20 minutes into my ride, I'm supposed to be going west. I'm going south. I'm, I'm closer to, to Indianapolis than I am to Chicago. Are you listening to me? But the Lord sent me signs to turn around. There's no construction on, uh, what is it, 94, I think it is, or 90, whatever it is going west. There's no construction. I, I, I noticed construction. I saw it. Ignore the sign. S speed limit change. You know when they change the speed limit, they give you a warning and they put it up there. Speed limit is going to change in so many days or weeks and you have a chance to adjust. Saw the sign. Ignore it. I just kept driving. This big old eight cylinder, 5.7 liter van running down the highway, burning up gas. And the Lord had to get my dummy. Turn around. 
Are y'all listening? How many of us are driving through life, ignoring the signs that God has given us to tell us to repent? What I'm saying, what I'm saying, please hear me, please hear me. We're talking about the conditions of salvation. Some people have been told to repent of some things, and you don't think it applies to you. We talked in Sabbath school today about the fact that God has a standard for everybody across the board, but the way God deals with each individual person is according to what they need. And so sometimes you don't think it applies to you because you don't think, because it doesn't apply to anybody else. I mean, because it doesn't apply, he, he, it can't be just talking to me because it ain't talking to no, no, he's talking to you. It doesn't matter if this one over here is in a saved relationship with Jesus and still doing some things they ought not. God has them where they need to be. Are y'all listening to me? Are you listening to me? There can be, listen, listen to what I'm saying, because we're talking about, we're talking about maturity, sanctification. So when we, when we, when we mature, when we grow, when we're being sanctified, God deals with us where we are, and he gets the stuff out of us that he needs to get out of us. But somebody else may not be right there. So they may be engaging in some stuff they ain't got no business engaging in, and they may be just as saved as they can be. And you may be doing the exact same thing, and you're in a lost state. Are y'all listening to me? Professor at the seminary told us, he, he said the problem with people, he was trying to help us to understand how to use the spirit of prophecy in the right way, but it applies to scripture too. He says, the Lord will give a five-mile testimony, right, talking to Ellen White, telling them, write this to Brother X. So they'll read the five-mile testimony of Brother X, right? Brother X, if you go five miles, you'll be where the God needs you to be. So, so years later, we read the five-mile testimony, and everybody decides going five miles is what gets us where we need to be. That's a problem. Brother X was only five miles away from where he was supposed to be. You may be 20 miles away. So when you go five miles, now you still got 15 more to go, but you're settling down like you saved. Then there are folk who are only a mile and a half away. They read the five-mile testimony. Now you three and a half miles are beyond where you need to be. That's called extreme and conservative. Okay. Are y'all listening to me? You got to read the thing in principle. What I'm simply saying is right now in this sanctuary are some folk who had the five-mile testimony, but you misunderstand how to apply it to your life because you don't know where you are. Right. Repent. That's condition. Number one, once God gets your attention, he tells you to turn around. See, see, when I was in that van, because I'm dad, you know, I do all the driving, I could have just turned around and said, oh, I was just checking something out. <laughs> I had to confess that I messed up. I'm glad my wife's not on camera and y'all didn't see what she just did. I had to confess that I messed up. Man, dad messed up, y'all. We're going to be about a half hour late because I didn't went the wrong, probably an hour late because I went the wrong way, a half hour out of the way, so I got to come back a half hour. You know what I'm saying? I had to confess. It, it, so number two, after you repent, you got to confess. If we're to be assured of salvation, we have to confess our sins. Right? The unpardonable sin is the sin we don't confess. Are y'all listening to me? The text says, 1 John 1, 9. The text says, the text says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's sanctuary language, y'all. Are y'all listening to me? We, we, we don't, there are people here who have done some stuff you haven't confessed to the people nor to God. Y'all listen, I, I know I'm telling the truth. In Alcoholics Anonymous and in Narcotics Anonymous, I used to work around those type, type um, places, right? They, they, teach, they teach that recovery doesn't take place until a person, person acknowledges that they have a problem. Acknowledges that they are addicted or drunk. And every week, I, I don't necessarily think you got to do this every week, but this is, this, this is the thought. Every week at the meeting, my name is blank, and I'm an alcoholic. Right? 
acknowledgement of the sin. Got to confess that thing. Y'all with me, with me? Steps to Christ, page 38. True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges a particular sin. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Now I'm good. Let me go run around and do what I got to do. No. Confession of sin is always of a specific character. Lord, forgive me for thinking that I was better than her and telling her off when she tried to help me. Lord, I know that I wasn't supposed to watch that program, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I have this thing inside of me that draws me to it. Please, Lord, take it out of me. Talking with a colleague at the seminary one time. And, and I don't know how we got to this conversation. It was in between a class. We had one of them three-hour classes. And so we were in between. And we were talking. And this guy said, man, I got anger issues, man. I, just, I, I got anger issues. And so we were talking, you know. And I said to him, what do you watch? He says, I love, I love MMA. I said, that's why you got anger issues right there. That's why, you, that's why you're angry all the time. You're aggressive all the time. He liked to watch folk bashing each other in their heads. Some things you don't confess because you enjoy it. And see, watch this. It's one thing to confess your sin. Amen? It's a whole nother one just to pray and ask, Lord, take something away with no confession. Y'all miss that. There's a whole bunch of folk in this sanctuary and watching online who pray and say, Lord, take this away. But you've never confessed that thing. And let me help you out, too. God doesn't take anything away. We surrender it. Amen. God is not a God of force. You ain't willing to give it up. He ain't taking it. And so you pleading, Lord, to, ain't never confess. Pack your bags, get up out that bed, and move out. Don't ask the Lord to fix it while you're laying there. That's repentance. And then when you walk out, Lord, I confess I should have never, please, I should have never been there. I knew better. Repentance, confession. Then we got to believe. After we confess, believe that God has done what he promised. If he says, he says if, if you could confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you, believe that. Believe that. Let me say something. Belief is vital. Vital means necessary for life. Your, your heart is vital. You, you, you don't have a heart, you're dead. Your lungs are vital. A amen? A necessary for life. To, to the woman with the issue of blood. In, 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 in uh, Matthew chapter 9, know what he said to her? Your faith, your belief in my ability to heal has made you whole. Oh, y'all missed that. Because she believed that he could do it, she was healed. In, in the same chapter, Matthew chapter 9, the story of two uh, blind men, healing from Jesus uh, came to them, and Jesus says to them, according to your faith, be it to you. If you're going to be forgiven, believe you're forgiven. Okay? John chapter 9, or John chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Y'all, yeah, I've shared this with you, and I'm telling you, a lot of this stuff, I was thinking about this morning when I was just kind of rearranging stuff, right? I was thinking, I said, Pastor, you say the same stuff to these people over and over again. You know why? Because I don't need to share something new. I, I don't need to come up. If I stand in this desk and I try to give you something new and spectacular and y'all, oh, you're so good. You always, it's so, enter later for entertainment. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to snatch myself and you out of hell. Are you with me? And I'm going to say the same things over and over again. You know why? Because those are the things that's going to keep us in the last day. I, this is not in my notes, but I'm just thinking this. Watch this. Right now, we're in a state where we can see more than ever before the uh, enforcement of the mark of the beast. I'm going to come back to the text, but here's what I'm about to tell you. The, 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 the mark of the beast 
when it's enforced, it says those who don't have the mark, who refuse the mark, those who stand on the side of God won't be able to buy or sell. Y'all know our dollar is getting stretched. Gas is $4.19. Are you with me? Everything in the grocery store has gone up 20 cents to 50 cents to 75 cents. Y'all know it, right? Everything's expensive. And so that means we got to hold on to the money we have. So, 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 so we're in this production consumption society, right? They make it, we buy it. They make it, we buy it. Well, now the shelves are getting a loss. Y'all, Walmart has always had full shelves. Now we're going in Walmart, they don't have anything. My wife went to get a certain food we eat for two weeks, and it ain't been in the stores. Y'all have had some of the similar experiences, right? So what happens is this. All of a sudden, they enforce the mark of the beast and say, if you don't do what we say and you don't worship the way we say worship, we're not going to let you purchase. A whole bunch of folk who stress right now that $4.19 gas is going to compromise. Are you with me? It's because you don't believe and you don't have that relationship is what I'm saying. Are y'all listening to me? According to your faith, be it to you. John chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Watch this. I'm talking about belief. This is John chapter 5, 6 through 9, New King James Version. When Jesus saw him lying there, talking about the man at the pool of Bethesda, and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to the man, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And the text says, watch this, immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Notice, 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 notice. The man didn't say, if you make me whole, I will obey. What the man did is he acted on the word of Christ. I told you before, the word of God spoken implies possibility. Are y'all listening to me? Because God said, get up and walk. He knew it was possible for him to get up and walk. So he got up and he walked. He believed the word of God. Are y'all listening to me? If the Bible says, I'm going to forgive you, believe you're forgiven. Peter, Peter walked on water. And you know what Peter did? Peter, Peter says, God, if it's you, bid me to come out. He didn't just walk out on water on his own. Please hear me. You can't just do it on your own. God's word spoken makes it possible. If it's you, invite me, command me. At the command of Jesus, Peter walked on water. And I told y'all before, all the preachers come up and they disparage people. Oh, he didn't have faith. They never walked on water. Even if it was for 10 seconds, he walked. Because he believed the spoken word of God. And I submit to you, if you believe the written word the same way you believe the spoken word, God will do things in your life that you have never seen done before. The servant of the Lord says it this way, speaking about Peter, speaking about John, speaking about the woman with the issue. In like manner, you are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. But God promises to do all this for you through Christ. Amen. Justification. Amen. God has spoken in his word. He's given promises. She says this, you believe that promise, act on that word. You confess your sins, hallelujah, and give yourself to God. And then she says, you choose to serve him. Here it is. Just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill his word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, God supplies the fact. Oh, that'll preach. You are made whole just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. Are y'all listening to me? I'm, ta I'm talking to people in this sanctuary, right? Good people. I'm telling you that some of you here today who came into this place and you were still lost. 
You were not in a saved relationship with Jesus Christ because you had you don't believe. You didn't confess that sin and you certainly hadn't repented. Got something else for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to just tell you this like this. Those of you, Pastor Bob, here's what I think I need. When we, when we ready to do the appeal, we got steps of Christ in the back, right? Somewhere in my office in the corner, somewhere in there. You, you just nod and go look for them. <laughs> I can't do nothing spontaneous with Pastor Bob. No, I apologize. Everything has to be planned out. Pastor Edwards, we, we have steps of Christ in the back, right? <laughs> He's going to get me. But no, listen, I want to give everybody steps of Christ who doesn't have one. If you don't have a steps of Christ, get the ste book steps of Christ and read it. All of you who have like an Ellen White phobia, right? Because somebody, they, you know, I've heard it all the time. They beat you over the head. I've been in the church 25 years. I didn't, well, weren't raised in the, I wasn't raised in the church, but my um, 15 year, well, 10 years, 10 years before I became a minister, nobody ever beat me over the head with Steps of Christ, 28 years, so 13 years. Nobody beat me over the head with Spirit of Prophecy. Nobody did that to me, okay? All right? And, and listen, let me explain something to you. Let me help you out real quick. Ellen White's writings are, um, they're, 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 they're inspired. Just like the Bible's inspired. Amen. Just like the pastor's sermons should be inspired. Amen. Same Holy Spirit. Equal inspiration, but not equal authority. Amen. It's a difference. The Bible is the canon. It's the measure. Everything is ciphered through the Bible and filtered through the Bible. I don't care what it is. Everything. And if it lines up with the scriptures, amen. If it doesn't, leave it alone. So what I'm saying is I want you to get, the, get a hold of Steps to Christ, and I want you to read it. I guarantee you it will change your life. Little small book. Here's what it says. I'm, talk, I'm, talking, about, I'm talking about believing and acting on the word of God and, and believing that God has forgiven you. Amen? And, and claiming it. God supplies the fact. Steps to Christ, page 51. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. But say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because Christ has promised it. Amen. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel it. But it's true nonetheless. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. One of our favorite scriptures is, quote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Doesn't look new. I told y'all before, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I was in the Marine Corps in my, in my barracks room by myself. And, and we had the, we had the, um, we had the, uh, the little things like where I do my type my letters and stuff. Well, I didn't type, but then wrote the letters. Secretary is what it was called. Anyway, we had that little thing. I hid behind that, closed the blinds, kneeled. I, 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 I didn't want nobody in the Marine Corps to know that this big bad Marine, well, this, this little bad Marine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want them to know I was giving my heart to the Lord, but I wanted to give my heart to the Lord. And I kneeled down, prayed that sinner's prayer, and I remember clear as it was yesterday thinking I felt nothing. And I hunched my shoulder and said, well, I did what they said. And I'm telling you, I declare to you, my life, I can look backwards at it and I know my life changed from that point forward. I felt nothing. Nothing, but I, hey, let me tell you something, man. When God works, he works. The, the, he, says, he says to Nicodemus, the wind blows uh, comes and goes and it blows where it wishes and we don't know where it goes and how it comes but we feel its effects or, and what he's saying is we can see it are you with me we see the I see the fruit hallelujah Acts chapter no John 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 
<laughs> I told the preacher I was going to go through this quickly the, the, in the back, but I'm not going through it quickly, Elder. You see I'm going slow. John chapter 6, verse 37. Listen to what it says. And, and, that, and, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Okay, no, you didn't get excited because, amen. 1631, Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be what? Saved. Acts 16, believe and you shall be saved. Are you mean? Belief, okay? As a matter of fact, in our scripture reading, we have two conditions, um, confession and belief. They're summed up in, in Paul's Paul's. Uh, book, in the book of Romans, here's what Paul says, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. For with, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Got to confess, got to believe. Are you with me? And then the last, the last thing, the last condition is surrender. All right? We, we have to surrender ourselves to Jesus. For some people, surrender is a struggle. We, we like what we like, right? But God says, let it go. And when, when we like what we like and God says, let it go, we struggle. Amen? Now, 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 now to be honest, there's a lot of people who are reluctant to surrender certain things. Watch this. Because of the church. The, ch the church said so. <laughs> right? Yeah, we, we don't want to change certain habits. I don't have to run the list. Y'all know. Because the ch church can't tell me what to do. Show me in the Bible. They show you in the Bible. Well, that's the Old Testament. <laughs> right? You... You, you, you don't want, you, you, you want to you wanna do what you do. You insist on doing what you do simply because you believe the church is telling you to give it up. Surrender. Let me tell you something. Uh, serving the Lord says God doesn't ask us to give up anything that is for our benefit to keep. And then remember a couple of weeks ago I read to you, she says, um, what do we give when we give up all for Christ? A sin polluted heart. Yet many think it too much to give a sin polluted heart to God. And then she says, I'm ashamed to think it. I'm ashamed to write it. But when we don't want to give up stuff and we come up with the excuse, our parents are making us do it or the church is telling us to do it when we don't want to surrender ourselves to God. So, so let me just say this real quick before I tell you what I'm about to say. When you go down to Wildwood, right, or Uchi Pines or wherever you want to go in order to get cleansing, what do they do? They put you on a total fast. They tell you give up everything, and whatever's good for you to have back, we'll introduce it slowly. You keep those things. Stuff ain't no good for you. You're not going to have it anymore. God says total fast. Give it all up and start over. <laughs> we, we come to God with a whole bunch of stuff. Can I keep this? Can I keep that? And we want to know what God can. And God's like, no, you can't keep none of it. Get rid of everything. Right. Nothing's good. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s. I mean, listen, me and my son were talking yesterday. We, what is rap music and hip-hop? I was like, hip-hop is a culture. Steve, hip-hop is a culture. Ain't that right? I had to give it up. All my cassette tapes. I had cassette tapes. Have mercy. <laughs> I had it all. You name it, I had it. Well, excuse me. I had all the stuff from the East Coast. I didn't do that Florida stuff. I didn't do that California stuff. Are y'all listening to me? I had it. God said, let it go. One of my best buddies, who we came, we came to church together, he confessed that 10 years later, he still had his, his, all his rap music just in case this Christian thing didn't work out. <laughs> y'all laughing. Some of y'all got some stuff. Phone numbers, subscriptions to things, just in, cause, just, just in case this does, he said, I'm holding on to it. I said, man, throw that stuff away. Get rid of it. C.D. Brooks said, C.D. Brooks said, he, he told the guy, the man came to him and said, Pastor Brooks, 
I got some good wine at the house. He said, well, first problem is there's no such thing as good wine. It may be expensive, but it ain't good. He said, what should I do with it? C.D. Brooks said, you can't give it away because if somebody gets drunk drinking that stuff and getting an accident, you're going to be accountable for that. Um, you can't sell it and make the money because the same thing may happen. So the only thing he said, you need, this is what C.D. Brooks said he told the guy. He said, go to your bathroom and, and, and consecrate your toilet as an altar. <laughs> he told him, open up them bottles of wine and pull them out on that altar. Get rid of them. And the man told him, if you'd have told me anything else, I wouldn't have joined your church. Ain't too many folk in the church like that today. Pastor, what should I do? Leave them. Well, Pastor, you know, we got all our bills together. And, you know, he takes my child to school. And, you know, it's just so hard. I, leave him. God will give you another man. God will give you another woman. Leave that job. I know you, Pastor, if I leave that job, man, you know, I don't know how I'm going to make my bills. I just go in. I only do one Sabbath a month. Leave the job. Keep the Sabbath. You, only, you may only work one Sabbath a month, but you only come to church one Sabbath a month, too. I know I'm preaching to somebody in here today. Pastor, write me a letter so I can get Sabbath. Oh, no problem. Write a letter. They take that thing and don't come to church. And, and the Lord, and, and you got grief on the job every day. Nobody's treating you right. Right? And you still go, still miserable, scared to quit because you think the job is taking care of you. Is, is God taking care of you or the job taking care of you? See, see, we are in this capitalistic society. This is one of them sermons where I'm just going to go ahead and do what I got to do. Is that all right, y'all? We're in this capitalistic society where we think we got to have everything everybody else has. And we're not satisfied with being able to have what we need and allowing God to bless us with a little extra. We want to get our own extra. It's not enough to have, <laughs> I'm about to say a Ford, but I drive a Ford, amen. It's not enough to have a Ford. Are y'all listening to me? We got to have the $60,000 vehicle. It's not enough to have, um, I don't know, 2,000 square feet. It's got to be 3,000. If it's just two of you, why on earth do you need 3,500 square feet? And then you complain trying to work to keep it. Now, I'm not saying don't have 3,500 square feet if it ain't hurting you. Because listen to what I'm saying. God has blessed some of us, and we can afford 3,500 square feet without lifting a finger. That's how God has blessed us. What I'm talking to is the person who's struggling to hold on to something that God has not given them that they've acquired for themselves. Are y'all listening to me? Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? It's a difference there. Surrender. One definition of surrender, and I told you this before too, is the giving over of a captive from one authority to another. You, you are held captive by sin, right? But you, you are the authority. Oh, y'all missed that. You choose, I told a priest a sermon about this, you choose your master, you choose who's over you. To whom you yield yourself servants to obey, you become that one servant who you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness, Romans chapter 6. Amen. We choose our masters. We are the authority. When we surrender, we turn ourselves over from one authority to another. Amen. Surrender yourself to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And stop surrendering yourself to sin. Challenge is this. When we surrender ourselves, we make ourselves vulnerable. Yes. Nobody likes to be vulnerable. We like to protect ourselves. We don't feel safe surrendering ourselves based on past experiences. We, 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 we've surrendered our hearts to people. And they've taken our hearts. They threw it down. They stomped. 
I'm not doing that again, but, but somewhere along the line, you get, you get a little brave and you dust your heart off and you, you give it to somebody else and they take that bed and they stomp it again. And after a while, we don't want to surrender anymore, not even to God, because we're tired of getting disappointed. And there's a lot of folk in church who don't surrender fully because they're protecting themselves from disappointment. But I'm going to tell you just like this, if this one ain't real, everybody's fate is the same. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Nobody has an advantage if Christianity is not real. All of us are lost. All of us are doomed. We, we, we're born, we live, we die, and that's it. But if Christianity is real and you don't have it and you have not embraced it, you have not surrendered yourself and, and, and taken it on fully, and when God comes a second time, you lose. And then finally, we got to surrender simply because of this. God doesn't force the will. He's not going to force us. I told you earlier, Lord, take this away. Lord, make, we pray prayers, make me do. Think about it. You're asking God to force him. God's not going to do what's contrary to us. He's not going to make you stop smoking. If you say, Lord, I can't stop. I like cigarettes. They relax me. They help me with my anxiety. Whatever it is, I smoke. I know it's not good for me, Lord. You know what? I need help. Give me the power of the Holy Spirit to resist this thing, Lord. Take the taste out of my mouth. I surrender it to you. Guess what? You'll get a different result. And then you know what God's going to do? You're going to go into the store. The cigarette's going to be calling your name. You don't think that stuff calls people's names? I know a lady who told my son, one, my, my daughter, one of them in school, she said she drives down the street. She had a problem with eating sweets. She said, the donuts call me. <laughs> I got some, got, got some witnesses in here. <laughs> That's, listen to what I'm saying. Stephen Lewis Preached a sermon, I heard his brother tell a testimony. He said, the man surrendered his life to Christ and he believes stuff like what I'm preaching. And he says, Lord, I surrender it to you. I give it to you. I don't want it anymore. He said he was driving down the street and all of a sudden a smell of alcohol filled his car. And he wanted a drink real bad. He said he got out of his car on the side of the highway, bowed down on his knees and said, Lord, I gave this thing to you. Take it away from me. I don't want it. I surrendered. I'm done with it. Are you with me? Got to do that. Got to do that. For some, in an instant. For others, watch this, it takes some time because not only is God working on that thing, there's something else behind it God's working on. Because it's not the outward behavior that God has the issue with, it's the issue of the heart. Okay, all right, I got a lot. I'm, about, I'm done. Here, here's, here's the question, though. Um, Sister Roberta, give me a second. I'm going to call you in a second. Many are inquiring. Steps of Christ, page 47 and 48. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is the, the $100,000 question. Pastor, I got everything you said. How does it work? Many are inquiring, how do I make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and in control by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. Lord, I ain't going to do it no more, but it doesn't hold. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections, your knowledge of your forfeited, your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity. The fact that you know that you have messed up in the past and probably going to mess up in the future makes you less sincere every time you talk to God. And it causes you to feel that you can't, God cannot accept you. Then she writes these words, but you need not despair. I shared this with you before. What you need to understand, she says, is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. Watch this. Don't miss it. Here it is. This is what makes the difference. The true force of the will, the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision. The power of choice, she says. Everything. How many things? 
Everything depends on the right actions of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, humans, uh, it is theirs to exercise. She says you can't change your heart. You can't change uh, your thoughts. You can't give your affections to God. But what you can do is you can choose to serve him. When you choose to serve him, she says you give him your will and then he'll work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. In that way, your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. I surrender. I give my heart to you, Lord, whatever you want to do now. Once you surrender, guess what? He ain't going to force you before you surrender. Once you surrender, come on, let's go. Huh? Let me let me let me just read this last through the right exercise of the will. Sister Roberta, uh, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, watch this, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. Do you miss that? When you, when you surrender your will, you become an ally with Christ. Amen? It's not him by himself. It's not you by yourself. It's you together. Right? You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast and thus through constant surrender you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. Y'all missed it because when we started off, it is by grace, through faith, through constant surrender, you'll be enabled to live the life of faith. What am I saying? I believe that there are some people present today who have never ever actually given their hearts to Jesus Christ. You are in church. You're on a church roll, but you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. I, 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 you, 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 you haven't prayed prayers of confession for your sins. You haven't professed your belief in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. You haven't asked God to apply the sacrifice that he made on the cross on your behalf. I believe that there are some people here who have not done that. Full grown adults, not kids. You haven't surrendered to him. You haven't even been engaged in, um, you, no, no, no. You, you have been engaged in an intellectual experience. You, you know intellectually. You've been going through this thing emotionally. You understand the doctrines of the church, right? Um, um, you know what it takes to stay in church. And you, you, you know how to function around church folk. You know Bible stories. You, 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 you practice the faith according to the seven-day Adventist tradition, but you have never prayed the sinner's prayer on your behalf. You, you never, you, 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 you've never invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Full and complete. I know I know what I'm talking about. Here's the question. If this is you, ask yourself, can I mark the moment of my conversion? If you can't mark the moment of your conversion, you probably aren't saying, not the day of your baptism, the moment of your conversion, the day your life changed when you encountered Jesus and surrendered to him. Do you get te teary-eyed and, and do you get chills every time you think about when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ? If you don't, probably not saved. Did, ask yourself, did I have a direct encounter with, or did I just go through the motion? I was always raised in church and one day everybody was getting baptized. I got baptized. Did I, did I have a direct encounter with church? If not, you may just be a good person. But good people will burn. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And then 21 says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have, 
as, also, as I, I also have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Text says the Savior is knocking. Can you hear him? Can you hear him? Can you hear him knocking at your heart? The Savior wants to come in. The Savior wants to come in. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you? Nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he is Today, I'm opening up the doors of the church to anybody in here who wants to open the door to Jesus to come into their hearts. Do not leave this church today a good person. Let today be the day that you encounter Jesus Christ full and complete. Don't play with it. Don't take a chance. We got these two preachers up here. They want to pray with you and pray for you. Right now, we don't, you don't have to wait till the church service is over. Come forward. Give your hand to the preachers. Give your heart to the Lord and let them pray for you right now. I know that there are people who came into this church today who did not uh, come in saved. But you're going to leave saved. You want to do that. Who, who will be bold enough? I don't care if you've been in church 30 years. Give your heart to the Lord today, full and complete. Is there one? Is there one? Brand new Christian. Never done it before. You're not gonna outweigh me. I'm gonna leave the Holy Spirit here until somebody moves simply because of God, God changed my message to speak to somebody's heart. I don't know who you are, but I don't want you to be lost. You're online and you're watching, type in the chat and we will contact you. Surrender your hearts to him today. Is there one? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you would penetrate the darkness that surrounds uh, that individual, whether present, or online, or whatever. We've done what you asked us to do, and we surrender uh, this time to the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work. May the Holy Spirit have his way. May you work on the heart of that individual so that they can have a saved relationship with you. Bless us all, Lord, to be determined to see you in peace when you come. Not because we're worthy, but because you desire it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
and amen.